a crossroads with the Green Party right now. Um, you know, we're still not taking corporate dollars. Climate change is still happening. Um, and so we have these really, really big problems that we need to solve that often that we don't necessarily find ourselves being able to solve. A lot of that due to the fact that we don't have the power. We haven't built the power even in our local communities to really impact um, some of these issues um, on a local basis and then therefore on a national basis. You know, during the campaign, what we found uh, were a lot of very noble, very hardworking people. Um, in every state party that were doing their level best to keep the lights on. And, you know, the, the, the mere idea of having to expand beyond that basic um, task really was hard for people to swallow because they find themselves wearing all kinds of hats. Um, you know, and there are a lot of structural issues and a lot of is reasons why that that situation happens that I actually want to touch on a little bit later. Um, towards, you know, as we roll into Chris's section. Um, but the long story short is, is that uh, we're a party of very, very committed people, uh, very intelligent people, very passionate people. What we don't seem to have is a lot of um, power, political power. So you've heard in the recent uh, few years, uh, for example, the Australian Greens um, in Queensland, Australia, and how they really were able to double their uh, proportional representation. Um, you know, and obviously that doesn't exactly correlate uh, to what uh, we deal with here in the United States, um, but there was a particular tactic that they used that we kind of want to talk a little bit about today. And I also want to draw correlations to, you know, more close to you all there in Maryland, the race of Franca Muller Paz and as well as Emmanuel Estrada in Baldwin Park, California. And the, the link between these three um, events and the success that they've had, I, you know, I wanna point out, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think Franco ran for the same district as the previous candidate, a green candidate that ran. Um, and that previous candidate got something like 1200 votes. Franca has got, had, you know, came out with uh, close to 5,000 votes. If I, if I have that data, same district, yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, that represents a marked increase in the profile of a Green Party candidate in Baltimore um, over just the last few years. And, you know, I'm gonna say things that many of you already know. Um, one thing for sure is that what Franca's team did and did very effectively was to have the personal conversations with voters in the district. Right, um, you know, there's stories in the in the Baltimore media about Franca, you know, personally going out to meet with volunteers um, to give them um, her uh, initiatives uh, for that particular canvas. And folks were actually going around and engaging in one-on-one -on -one conversations, a man on the street kind of a conversation. They were knocking on doors. There was phone banking. There was text banking. There was all of those kinds of things. And those seem those kinds of things seem really daunting to us. But what we can really say is that Franca uh, placing second in that uh, District 12 race, I think that's what it was, um, compared to the previous can green candidate um, and using employing these tactics really, really made a difference. Now, there was a disparity between the first place uh, person and, and Franca, um, but she got more than half as much as the votes that that, that uh, candidate, uh, the other candidate that won. And, and you know, there are those naysayers that are going to say to us, well, you know, she only got second place, she didn't win, but what, what I'd, 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 I would submit to Greens when we look at that race is, is we really have to see that for the win that it is, right? Um, the amount of work, the amount of coalition building that happened, I mean, there was even a Democratic uh, council person that elect that that endorsed Franca, right, and and kind of broke ranks with with his own party, you know. So that kind of raising the profile and things like that is was very uh, it contributed a lot to the success that she had. I don't know about you all um, in Maryland, but I feel very proud of the green work um, in in her race. I mean, I think it was really really exemplary, and it represents kind of the stepping stone and the programs that we need to put in place to be able to do something uh, big later on, right? Um, we as Greens, we understand sustainability. 
And so this has to be a question. What is our capacity to do these things? And what is it going to take to, to do that? Uh, you know, and I, I'll pivot over to uh, Emmanuel Estrada's race in Baldwin Park, New York, or excuse me, California. And I'm looking at Howie, so I'm saying New York. Um, you know, and, and literally what Emmanuel did was the same kind of what they call retail politics. I don't like to use a lot of the political jargon because I don't, you know, why? Um, but li literally what that means is taking your campaign directly to the voter, right? And so Emmanuel was actually knocking on doors, having conversations. Baldwin Park is a small, uh, smaller uh, kind of suburban community. Uh, community in LA County. He had an advantage as well because he's bilingual and that had a, you know, there they have a large concentration of uh, Spanish dominant, if not Spanish monolingual people. Um, and and he's very young. I mean, the stories that were in, in the media of that time were of Emmanuel having to take another job to help fund his campaign. You know, so it's like kind of like the Mr. Smith goes to Washington sort of thing, you know, the underdog story. And it's such a it's such a great success story. And it's all due to this one on one relationship, relational kind of organizing, as some people like would say, uh, retail politics. Right. So Chris is going to talk a little bit more about the tech side of it and the things that you need to do in order to be able to manage kind of having these conversations. What I want to talk about more is is the uh, the reality of where we're at, what what it actually takes to create a program like that, um, you know, and and sort of a rationale for having a program like this. <clears throat> I, I I think I can speak for many of us when I point out that a lot of greens, even though that we're very passionate we sometimes tack toward the socially awkward, right? It's a little difficult for us to, you know, strike up a conversation. Not all of us are all that intensely charismatic and gregarious. And, you know, it's not natural for a lot of us to kind of like, hey, have you heard the good news about the Green Party today? Well, right. Um, and so what we need to be able to do, I think, is to start to look at, the voters in our district and the people in our areas um, as uh, family, and I don't mean this in a kind of like a, you know, a touchy feely kind of way, although I kind of do, but I think that the concept of solidarity has to be really central in our minds. What is it about me as a green that I care about and how does that literally impact the people in my community? How does that make me feel, right? Um, and what do I want to do about it? There are a lot of barriers that we, we encounter as Greens. You know, the media hates us. The Democrats are always trying to get us and knock us off ballots and things like this. You know, we don't have the advertising budget that the, the big two parties have. But one thing that is always going to counteract those uh, strikes is our di direct connection to people in our community. And it just seems maybe a little artificial for us to think about, you know, well, I'm just gonna knock on somebody's door. You need to have a real strategy in mind. And this is something that you all have to work on collaboratively, co collaboratively in your local organizations before you, you start doing it. One thing that the Australian Greens, the Queensland Greens actually did is that they sat down and they mapped out a strategy. They looked at the data, they looked at demographic data. What is the, the age range of people that, they're, that they wanna talk to? You know, are they renters even? They looked at, at that, that piece of data. You know, what, are the, what, are the, what is the economic uh, situation for the people that they wanted to talk to? They also have very clear in their mind the type of person who they thought would more likely want to support the Green Party this time around. And so they drew up a good profile of who that person is. You know, um, and and so it, and and funny enough is that the profile that they drew up is someone that uh, looks a lot like a lot of the people in our communities that really have a material stake in wanting to do something different than the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, they right now they tend to be millennials. Uh, they really, um, you know, a lot of them are working service industry jobs. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of student debt. A lot of them are very concerned about climate change. 
Um, a lot of them are having questions about whether or not they're going to be able to afford having children. And so these economic and these climate kind of issues are really, really important to them. Um, you know, and, and they tend to, uh, you know, buying a home is something that's going to be completely out of reach for them. <clears throat> so it's really incumbent upon every one of us in our in our local organizations, even at the state organization, to really think about who it is our solutions are going to matter most with when you're developing your strategy. One, one thing that, um, you know, the camp campaign team heard me say a lot of time is qualify the lead. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, and that I borrow that term from the sales and marketing environment. And basically what that means for sales and marketing is who is the person that is most likely going to buy your good or service? And that's the person that you wanna gear your conversation toward, right? So by that token, this is kind of what I'm talking about right now. There has to be a strategic decision made within your organization on who your target actually is. What a lot of locals and state parties are starting to realize is that some of the people that they tend to talk to often are not really people that have a material stake in what we have, the, the solutions that we have as a Green Party, right? You know, a lot of times we tend to talk to people that are older, that are probably retired or very close to being retired, um, that are actually have some expendable income, their house may be paid off, they might be academic. And so you can see, once you start to drop the profile of who you actually tend to talk to versus the person that you think is more likely to help grow the Green Party, then you can kind of see the disparity and strategically your local or state party needs to make a decision about whether or not for the growth and the health of the Green Party, whether or not uh, some things need to change, right? And so how do you do that? How do you get in touch with people? Now, uh, Maryland's uh, state law says that you have to be a resident of Maryland in order to get the voter registration list for, for any of them, but for the party at least, right? The state party ought to have, um, and, and I believe the state party still uses Nation Builder, they ought to be able to peel off a portion uh, of the database to give to you to your local, right? So that you can start looking through there. Um, and, you know, who are the Greens that, that you are in contact with? Who are Greens that you haven't heard from in a while? You know, and when you start kind of scaling your profile back, um, you know, and determining who's the person most likely to resonate with the green uh, message, you know, look for that person in that, in that list, right? Now, what often happens in our locals is we don't really have the people power to be able to pursue, uh, you know, these kinds of initiatives, right? These kinds of uh, projects. A lot of times, and I think we have to be really honest about this, a lot of times there's one or two people that are really keeping the lights on. They're the ones that are doing all the work. If there's, you know, and, there, and there's other things like, uh, you know, uh, communication and outreach that a lot of times fall by the wayside because we just don't have enough people. We don't have enough hands, right? Okay, yeah, Vince, I'll, I'll, I'll come to your question after, in, in a few minutes. I think we're doing a question and answer session um, after, uh, Chris and I present. Um, you know, we have to be very, very honest that there are only a few people um, that that are even halfway willing to talk um, to to voters, you know, and to people in our communities. One thing that the Queensland uh, Greens made as a priority was political education. And so they got their people, you know, their regular activists, they got, you know, kind of rank and file people that are, you know, connected with the Green Party and sat them down and really started educating them on the solutions that they had to offer and the imperative of the solutions that they had to offer. So that, you know, you had people through political education whose interest in the Green Party, you could hone and get them more activated and beginning that conversation with those people and really talk to them about the necessity of everybody working together, uh, you know, to bring that policy, those that set of policy around. And so because of the fact that we have too few people uh, keeping the lights on in our party, it's that kind of outreach and things like that, that we, we often don't get to do. 
I want to be very honest about another dynamic. And I don't, you know, and this is something that we've in the campaign, we've seen across the board uh, throughout the, the party all over the country. And that is that the interpersonal strife sometimes helps to create that situation. And so what we need to be able to do is understand how conflict impacts people. Um, I really advocate for having sort of a code of conduct for each local and state party so that we can try to have a common democratically arrived set of guidelines for how we interact each with each other. You know, I, I've been uh, organizing in the National Party for several years now, and one of the major things that keeps coming up is that this person had a dispute with that person. I've seen it everywhere. Um, you know, and so therefore they don't participate anymore. And so we, we, we have to have the courage to have conversations with each other. And maybe they need to be mediated conversations sometimes, but we need to be able to work through conflicts in a way that leaves everyone whole, right? That everyone is, is heard. You know, we, we have to practice peace in our local organizations not just in, you know, refraining from physical violence, but sometimes we need to be honest with ourselves about the violence that is generated from strife that is left unaddressed, right? And so I would, you know, Utah, for example, has a conflict resolution policy. They have a grievance policy that they've written into their bylaws. And I actually think it's pretty good. And, and if you, you all ever have a chance to go look at the, the Utah Green Party of Utah website, look for that and just kind of see how they've laid things out because I think that's uh, that's really necessary. We have to be intentional in our, in our groups um, about dealing with conflict because if you have a whole lot of conflict in your organization, um, you're not going to be able to come up with a common strategy. And then you have this situation where you have people going off to this side, you know, uh, deal, you know, kind of trying to implement the strategy, but the job is too big because we don't have enough hands on deck. And so we need to try to address that. And, and I don't want to get too much deeper in that because every situation is different, but it is a common situation throughout the Green Party. So, you know, I think that we, as part of the strategy, where there are internal conflicts, the strategy needs to include dealing with that, right? And using democracy as much as possible um, so that everybody gets a chance to, to be heard, everyone gets an opportunity to put a proposal on the table, you know, and, and just allowing people to speak and to be heard and to feel that they're that they're that they're being respected that's so so important so once you've dealt with that then a strategy that you uh put together it really needs to be determined and informed by the conversations that you're having with people in your community one thing um it, that i can say about howie for example is um you know just a, a funny little story my neighbor here in Denver is actually from Syracuse, um, and he's an unaffiliated voter. In other words, he hasn't, he's not, he's a declined estate. He's, he's, he's an independent voter. I guess he always has been from the time that he was in Syracuse. And I happened to mention to him that, that Howie was going to be in town for events that we had here in Colorado. And he said, oh, I know who Howie is. He talks to everybody. Everybody knows what, what's on his mind. And I just thought that was just so amazing. And it just, it, it made perfect sense, right? Uh, that people in Syracuse know who Howie is because Howie's the kind of person that will, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, will actually talk to people and, hey, what's going on? Well, what do you think about this? And, you know, and he can tell you a little bit more about those conversations that he has. But Howie is kind of like a great example for the rest of us because he's, he's so... Um, into his community, he's so well known in his community because of those one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and, and the relationship um, building that he's been employing, just kind of like as a natural consequence. I mean, if you get to know Howie, he's, a, he's curious about other people, you know, he, Howie is very, very good about sitting back and letting you say everything that you need to say, right? And then he'll come in with, you know, because he's also an encyclopedia, right? Then he'll come in with some information. Well, I always thought that da 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 da. And it's it's never his approach is never. Well, no, you're wrong about that, or that's not important, right? Which, if if we're honest, I think sometimes as Greens we tend to do that because our solutions are so good, right? Uh, but Howie has this way of really um, de-escalating about making people feel heard about 
letting people speak their piece, then I think these are skills that we have to employ, right? So you, I started to say earlier that you can get a voter list um, and, and, the, uh, and the, the state party will be able to carve out one for your particular community. And, you know, once you've resolved conflicts, once you've, you have um, uh, goals about how many conversations that you want to have in a week um, and kind of the things that you want to hear from people, you kind of put together a rough script that is more about listening than it is about prescribing. Um, and you have enough hands on deck, then you can determine as a group, you know, what is it that you really want to do? Um, what, what, what is it that you want to hear? Um, and, and a lot of times, if we're also being perfectly honest, most Greens have not heard from the party in a long time. So my recommendation to local organizations would be to start out calling all the Greens that are on the list that you can get from the state, or, or you can visit them. You know, maybe they're people that you've known from when the local started and you haven't seen them in a long time. Then if they know you, that's a great person for you to reach out to and just say, hey, what's going on? What's, you know, what's new with you? What are kinds of things are you working on? And start by surveying your greens who are, um, uh, how should I say, they're, they're familiar. The conversations should be easier. You already have a common bond with them, but it's very, very important to reconnect with those folks and just check in with them as much as you possibly can. Um, you know, we're still dealing with the pandemic. And one of the decisions that we had to make, uh, you know, while we were petitioning on the campaign is, um, great, you're calling all the Greens of Baltimore right now, right on. Well, one of the decisions that we had to make um, on the campaign during the pandemic, what are we going to do with petitioning? You know, we can't really do door knocking. And so we put a lot of emphasis on phone banking and text banking, you know. Now, we were not a very wealthy campaign, so we didn't have a lot of resources. Uh, so we had to really push more towards the robocall side. We had to push more toward the phone banking side because the text banking side was twice as expensive as the phone banking side. And unfortunately, the way it works out, um, not everybody picks up their phone. Um, and some people pick up their phone at certain times of the day. You know, if you're targeting millennials, you need to understand that they're probably at work. And so you want to get them between those hours of maybe 6 to 9 p.m. when they're probably more available, uh, but then probably not, right? So you just, what, what you need to do is actually start doing it and see what your trends are. Keep your data on it. How many, uh, you know, what time of the day are you most likely to get answers? Um, and then kind of focus your activity toward that time of the day. Um, how am I doing with time, Virginia? You're fine. Okay. Let me just kind of look back here. Uh, Vince Tola, I agree that relational organizing is very effective. If we bring that organizing to our small towns and rural areas, pushing radical democracy and solutions to the effect of neoliberalism, we could expand our power in those areas. Should the MGP put more emphasis on organizing? Should the MGP put more emphasis on organizing and running in our small towns and rural counties? So. Um, I want to uh, share a success story with you, Vince, and everyone else, and that is in West Virginia. Now, Little Birdie tells me, and we haven't um, said anything about this publicly yet, but um, our uh, Mountain Party friends, so the Green Affiliate in, in West Virginia is called the Mountain Party of West Virginia. What they've been able to do in a small community is to flip one of the council members to the Mountain Party reg Party registration, and you know they they focused on this. This happens to be the most progressive uh, 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 council member. Uh, this council member is a Latina. Actually, you know her family's from Guatemala, like mine is, which I thought was really cool. Um, you know, and they, they really focused their messaging on her and kind of flipped her over. And so while I don't necessarily advocate for spending a lot of energy on flipping elected officials over, um, I do think that that's indicative of the possibilities in a rural community. So just to kind of give you an idea here in Colorado, we have 65 different districts. Uh, we have, uh, 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 I should say, uh, house districts, and the majority of those districts, um, counties are in these very, very rural and very remote areas. 
Um, there's famously, there's a, a Hinsdale County here in Colorado, which has, I, I think it's something like 200 registered voters altogether, right? Now, I do think that we can build a lot of power, especially when it gets to, um, to, to winning legislative seats where coincidentally the ballot access laws come from. Um, you know, I think that trying to go after some of these rural seats is very important and it's a very, very good strategy. Um, one strategy that I, I think you all in Maryland have employed is to kind of go narrow and deep. In other words, everybody focus on one race and just, you know, put all of your resources behind that. If, if that's not you, I, I, I apologize. And so you all are gonna have to investigate what it looks like because just as there's a lot of opportunity in rural, rural counties, the reality is, is that we really don't have a green presence in the rural counties, right? But one thing, one data point that you all need to kind of look at as you kind of determine whether or not that strategy would work for the state is to look at voter turnout. Don't look just as much, just just at what the percentage of Republicans, what they did versus the percentage of votes for Democrats. What you really need to look at, the data point you need is how many registered voters are in that district, how many of them are of what party, how many of them are for whatever party, and how many votes were actually cast. And what you're going to see more often than not in those rural counties that tend to lean uh, conservative, quote unquote, because Greens are also conservative about other things, right? Uh, but what more often than not, that what you're going to see in those districts is that the voter turnout is actually quite low. And so what that indicates is that the right-leaning voters are checking out of their own politicians' rhetoric and policies. That presents an excellent opportunity. And this is the genius of the Green New Deal, right? Those coincidentally tend to be places where you got youth that are flee fleeing to the cities, where there's a lot of economic de deprivation, where Walmart is the only game in town, where the jobs are, oh my God, le way less than minimum wage in some cases, the federal minimum wage. And there, and there are a lot of people really suffering. There's not enough welfare to go around. The schools are not well-funded. You're gonna see a lot of this kind of things. You know, the COVID rollout, the vaccine rollout hasn't been very good. You're gonna see a lot of these things. And so the, the voter turnout in those districts will indicate to you is that the right-leaning voters are not getting served. What an excellent time to talk about the Green New Deal in those districts, right? What is a Green New Deal for this right-leaning county? What does that look like? When you start talking and you, and you don't, you know, try. Now, I'm a socialist. I like calling, you know, talking about socialism and things like this. But in a district like that, I probably wouldn't be talking socialism. I would be talking about the commons. I would be talking about what do we get for our taxes? I would be talking about things like that, right? And so I would, because I would spend some time and try to talk to some of those voters and kind of see what resonates with them and what doesn't, I would be gearing my message about what a Green New Deal for that county looks like using sort of the terminology and the maybe the little, little bit of the rhetoric that they tend to use. Because if we put our guard down, a lot of times people are saying exactly what we're saying. They're just, they're just using different verbiage, right? And, you know, if I want to sell something to you in English, the last thing that I'm going to do is to market to you in Spanish, right? You got to use the language of the people that are there and you're only going to achieve that by having the conversations. So I would really encourage you all to kind of take a look at, at, at that. Um, you know, um, there are some districts that for Greens would be completely winnable because that voter turnout for Republicans is going to be pretty low overall. Um, and you can make the case there to, uh, uh, to, to people in those areas that, oh, on top of it, the Democrats aren't doing anything for you, right? Because they're not, they're not able to, they don't have the power to do it. So I would really recommend uh, digging into that. Um, Mary says, thank you for bringing up working through conflicts. We, we got to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, we are all we have. All we have is each other. You know, we, we don't wish ill on each other. We just... We want to be heard and we want to feel respected. 
and there are different, you know, things that, that kind of impact that or whatever else. But, you know, we, we, we've got to give the old college try with each other. Um, so Vince, how am I doing with time? Good? Yep, you're fine. Okay. The West Virginia example is, is a college town with a low turnout surrounded by rural areas, which is very winnable kind of race to focus on in Maryland. And there are a few places that we could do really well. I absolutely agree with that. But, you know, just like we believe in sustainability for all kinds of other things, we also need to think about sustainability for our political action. We, you know, we have to sit down and we have to analyze our states. We have to look at our counties. We have to see, you know, is, is there a lot of fracking in a rural community? You know, and what can we say about that? Is there activism already happening? Um, you know, and, and so we we have to look at it as an opportunity to build connections in those places where we don't have them originally. You know, and when there's uh, when there's fracking, there's 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 homeowners there, landowners there that that are really really mad that their water is getting polluted. Right? That's a logical place for us to start building relationships. So, um, you know, uh, so this was kind of like. You know, here and there, I, I introduced a lot of concepts here, so I, I would encourage any of you to go ahead and put questions into the uh, chat there that Chris and I can deal with. Um, because what, what he's going to deal with is more the hows. I, I dealt with the whats. Um, you know, and just, just to kind of recap where I was coming from, you know, I think that we do have to deal with, with conflicts because we have to make sure that we have enough hands on deck to be able to complete the work. We have to democratically arrive at, or arrive at a strategy for how we're going to build power in our communities. That strategy needs to include um, a, a, a model, a prototype of, a, of the type of person that right now is more likely to join the Greens or even to vote Green or support Green initiatives, right? When we come up with the strategy, we need to also em employ um, a, a program of political education to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, sometimes you encounter people that have been green forever and they have ideas about what's in the platform that we, we actually don't have. You know, so at, at very least, we need to have some sort of um, initiative to bring all of our regular people on the same page. Um, those regular people also, uh, we need to reach out to them and we need to contact them. A lot of greens do have some time on their hands and they are willing to help out. And really, if you don't ask, you don't get, you know, so we need to make sure that we value them, that we're interested in what, what's going on with them. They know that. And then we invite them to, to help us build, right? Um, if you look at your green list, you'll see people that have been registered green for eons, <laughs> you know, and you probably have never seen them at a local meeting. And it's probably because they haven't been invited to one, right? I, I just kind of like as a corollary to that, what I, one of the things I want to point out is that having a political education event or session or something needs to be something different from your business meeting. You know, one of the things that Howie points out all the time is that you don't invite new people to the business meeting where you're haggling about, you know, this, you know, little line item in the budget or whatever, you know, you, you, this is, and, and, and you can also look at your political education events, opportunities, even if it's just an online reading group of some type, right? Um, you, you can look at those also as party building activities as well. But, you know, the main focus, obviously, of that kind of an event is to kind of help everybody gel uh, their thinking around a, a way to talk about a certain thing, right? So then once you have that political education accomplished, once you've come up with the, you know, kind of a survey that you want to talk to people then you have to think about you know what are you how are you able best able to implement that are you going to go knocking on doors are you going to try to phone bank are you going to try to text bank um you know emails are actually quite good um and, and that's we, we could have a whole session on, on on talking about how to write an email that's impactful and you know uh, how to write a subject line that's going to cause people to open that's a whole other thing that we can at some point, dig into a lot more deeply. Uh, anyway, but the main thing is, is that that strategy needs to be implemented. That strategy needs to be staffed. That strategy needs to uh, carry out after a while, slowly but surely, hopefully more surely than slowly, you will begin to see more people engaged with your local party. 
and the more people you have engaged, the more hands there are on deck to accomplish these, these goals, right? The main, main thing is to find ways and put into practice a strategy for having conversations with people in the community. You have to inform yourself about how people feel about things um, and not create a, like a local platform that is done in a vacuum and doesn't speak to people, right? It doesn't even address the issues that they think are important. You can only come to that if you're starting to have those conversations with people in your community. And really, if all you do in your local for the next five years is just go from person to person and have those conversations, that's actually going to be time well spent. Because when you decide to run somebody, then the word green resonates because, ah, I had that conversation with them and they listened to me and you know, so um, I've got some links to, uh, you know, a, an article in Jacobin about the Australian Greens, uh, Baldwin Park, uh, Emmanuel Estrada. I don't think I need to put links in there about Franca's race because I think you all kind of more or less know about her. But, you know, you'll see the commonality in these in, in these situations is that people had conversations and started building relationships with one another. So, um I'll wait for your questions on the Q&A section. And Chris, my man. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, before I dive into my part, you know, we, we dove into a, a personal issue to me, and that is, uh, you know, or that is small town organizing. I grew up in a town, a county of 5,000 uh, with one stop play. So... Um, you know, I've got some experience uh, with rural communities and, um, you know, I, even in a, you know, thinking about, you know, Baltimore and Maryland, even, even in a place like Baltimore, which is so heavily democratic, um, there are a lot of, you know, conservatives still have a lot of conservatives around uh, for them to, you know, work with. Um, it just based on population numbers, um, you know, Chicago may, be, may go Democrat every single time, but uh, there's 8 million people in the metro area, uh, and that includes a lot of Collar County with conservative leanings and things like that. So, you know, growing up as someone who at 11 uh, read Machiavelli's The Prince and then dove into The Art of War and then transitioned in the, to the manifesto, um, I can say being a progressive, being a socialist in these rural communities is probably about the loneliest political existence in our country. Um, but they are there. Right in that county of 5,000, I didn't, I didn't before I got on this call, look up um, what our numbers were in 2020. But in 2016, hundreds of votes for Jill Stein came in, right? Uh, rural communities are not being represented by the Republican Party, who is far more interested in, in representing agribusiness, uh, which is devastating these communities. Um, and so, and the Democratic Party doesn't even try. Right. These solid, these solidly red places, they don't even try. Um, so there's a huge opening in rural communities. And it's a whole lot. The, the, the bar to meet is a whole lot easier. Right. If, if you're running in a race where a few hundred votes gets you a win, you could knock those doors even without a team. Right. You can you can talk to people one on one. And it's a scale that small green parties can handle. Uh, I do want to warn, though don't airdrop in, right? You need local organizers that you've built a relationship. Um, if you're coming in from Baltimore into a small town, you're going to be met with, um, you know, the, the city versus rural conflict right off the bat that you're going to have to get over. Um, and you're going to have to deal with you know the problems that come with air dropping in without a ground game um you know so a lot of what i just wanted to throw that out there a lot of what uh andrea said regarding you know the material conditions is very much what i you know what my my second tech and social media and those things especially in green circles where they're often misunderstood are seen as these silver beads go knock on doors, and that's just not the case. If we're doing that work, we're misusing social media. 
um, social media and systems are simply tools to help back up that organizing. Um, so we've got to make sure that we're, you know, we're using them with that in mind. And before I really dive into systems with two, Andrea just mentioned, you know, how he says, don't invite people to your, um, you know, new people straight to your business meeting. It's absolutely true. You, we have to have multiple ways for people to engage with us, right? Uh, and social media and digital events and those kind of things are one of those ways. Um, they're one of the different platforms that we can use to allow people to engage with us, that we can use to build a relationship, that we can use to develop organizers. Um, but that said, you know, you've got your local should have multiple ways every month for people to get involved, not just your membership meeting. Have an educational event like uh, like Andrea said. Do a work, do a panel workshop with a local with another local organization and build that build that um, relationship. Have organizing meetings on issues. Um, have concrete ways, not just one. Go to this meeting that people can get involved and do the work, because a lot of people have no interest in sitting in a business meeting. At the same time, the people that are interested in admin and bylaws and the kind of things that you'll do at a business meeting, uh, they might, might not have any interest in organizing around an issue, right? So when we only have a very small number of ways to engage, uh, we've, we automatically likely exclude the overwhelming majority of potential supporters. Um, so it's really have social events. I, I've always used uh, the Shawnee Green Party in Southern Illinois as an example. Before the COVID pandemic, they had three events every month. They had their business meeting, like we all do. They had a monthly workshop on an educational workshop on an event that they almost always partnered with another organization on. So they were building those ties there. And then they had a social event at a bar once a month um, called Green Drinks, where people would come and absolutely work happened there, right? Um, I've long said that in my experience, the best work when I've been at national at national meetings or state meetings or things like that, the, mo the best ideas, the most groundbreaking things aren't coming in the meeting. They're coming at 2 a.m. sitting in a bar when there's not a formal structure and someone throws out the idea, right? And then you, you go on it. So you've got to offer as many ways as you can to... Uh, for people to engage. So as Regina said at the beginning, I was the social media and tech director for the Howie Hawkins campaign. Um, those of you that have been around national meetings and things have probably seen me for the last few years, really since 2017, I've been doing workshops every year. Um, and I've been always been doing one um, on systems and resources. I, I've long called it the gospel of Michael Dennis. Um, Mike Dennis was a uh, GPUS co-chair and member of the Youth Caucus that I served with. Um, they actually had to resign, um, but the work that Mike did in the National Party of trying to lay a systems groundwork uh, that would make our work more effective and more efficient, uh, I kind of picked up and for the last uh, three years or so have been doing these workshops. Um, so that said, I uh, I have a I'm a new dad. I have a, a two week old today baby downstairs and I was worried about not being able to do workshops as I usually do at the annual national meeting. So I did three of them earlier this year, uh, one on social media for grassroots parties, one on systems for organizations and parties and one for systems and tech for campaigns. So, you know, today I'm going to talk about some kind of broad based stuff, but I'm not going to get into what what system should we, you use. I might, you know, name a few or things like that, um, but I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. If you're interested in that, those are all on our, our YouTube, um, on the Howie Hawkins YouTube, and I just put links there for each of them. Uh, they're each an hour long, so, you know, in, we're, I'm t for today I'm basically taking three hours of content and, and smashing it down into 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, warnings and things like that, I'll kind of get into it. Um, when I do these workshops on systems and resources, I always start with the question of what is a resource, right? In terms of politics, it tends to be money, people, or systems. Um, you know, and in mainstream politics, in Republican and Democratic Party politics, and corporate politics, 
even in you know progressive politics, that primarily means money, and the major parties have a lot of it, and we don't, right? And we Greens by just based on our values limit. You know, we self limit the funding that we can like get. Um, you know, there's campaigns, there's party mo money, there's PACs, there's super PACs, there's soft money, there's dark money. The entire electoral system is set up around controlling and funneling money. Um, you probably heard us talking about HR one and how it does things. You know how it uh, makes that situation even worse. Um, so one problem I often see is that Greens keep that mindset, right? A campaign needs that needs some support. How do we support them? We give them a minusculely small amount of money for a campaign. We give them a hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars if they're lucky. Um, and that money in reality is a drop, and it's nothing compared to what their opponents have. And it's really probably a drop in the bucket of what they would need to you know, be funding on that level. So we have to think about, we need to really start rethinking about what resources mean to us, what we bring to the table. Um, Andrea also mentioned, you know, talked a lot about ha all hands on deck and how we are a small group of very dedicated people. Um, that means that our volunteers, our leadership is often very, 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 very overworked and wearing many, many hats. So we need to think of resources that can help us do the work more efficiently. That can take those, you know, some of these tasks off of our, all off of our plate. Um, you know, we need to look into systems that make us more efficient. We need to be hyper aware of how overstretched we are. The time we're taking up, we need to prioritize training and development um, of a bench to get that to get us through. So, you know, if we don't have money, right, and if our people are overstretched, um, until we get more people, which then, you know, as was mentioned in the, um, as was mentioned in the chat by Andy, you know, with dues and things, more people can mean more money. It should mean more money. So, you know, those two kind of things will kind of have to start taking care of themselves. Um, but that leaves us with systems, right? That leaves us with tech and things like that. Um, and as I, I really want to emphasize, especially since I'm talking to a state party, um, the home for this kind of stuff in my mind is in the state parties or in a, in a real ideal world in a highly functioning national party as well could offer downstream. Uh, systems, but you know, with, with when we think about where most of these kind of innovations come from, where does tech where does tech come into our parties? It's usually from campaigns, and campaigns are finite things; they end, right? Um, and so, all that good tech that got built up, unless there's a really good onboarding into the party, unless there's a process set up, um, a lot of these great things disappear. And they may come back in two years when someone runs again, but they, they go into hiatus. So state parties are really an ideal, and local parties are really a low, an ideal place for this kind of stuff to be housed, um, you know, because they're, they're long-term organizations. Uh, when you set up your phone banking, you can train someone on the state level, and they can operate and train everyone across the you know you know it was mentioned that you all had nation builder um you know that so that means that you need to make that that statewide health system can be applied downstream that you can all have your uh, you can access to your lists the ability to send emails web pages all the things that come with nation builder um and i also want to you know i mentioned earlier we tend to give you know this these minuscule amounts of money um we can get way more bang for our buck investing in the infrastructure than we can giving money to you know small campaigns um one of the most common expenses i see in this realm uh is yard signs right so i i know in illinois we have had the state party or a local party give a hundred dollars to a candidate that can in the turns around and buys yard signs right and depending on print dollars um not a lot. I mean, yard signs don't vote, um, just like retweets don't vote. And we'll get into that later. Um, you know, yard signs tend to make your existing voter, your existing supporter feel like they got something that makes them feel like they're doing something to support without actually knocking doors and canvassing. Meanwhile, for $100 in systems, um, you can get 
get over 1,400 minutes. You get almost 3,000 text messages. And this is these are pricing based on Call Hub. There's a lot of other systems out there that you can use, um, but those are just Call Hub based um, numbers. And those resources can be directed towards any candidate. Right, so it's not just that one candidate that you wanted to support with your hundred dollars getting twenty-five yard signs. It's every single candidate you have in the state. It's your presidential candidate. It's your statewide candidates. It's your uh, local candidates. They can all use that resource. Um, there may, depending on your state and you know how you, how things are functioning, you may kind of have to have two call hub accounts. That's what we ran up in Illinois, ran into it in Illinois. We had a federal account where we would spend money for our federal candidates and we had a local account where we'd spend money for state house or local candidates. Um, you know, so that's just call hub or that's just uh, investing in a system for, for phone banking. Um, something like StreamYard, which is what we use to do our live streams. Um, and and I'll, when I get to social media in a minute, I'll, you know, I'll hammer down that live stream is God on most uh, platforms. You can get six months of professional you know, branded streams that you can put out that six months that you can be doing things every single day. If you wanted to, to reach out to people on social media, I wouldn't necessarily suggest an everyday stream, but you could, um, you could invest it in something like a project or team management so, uh, software. Um, you know, 40%. So you it's like base camp, right? Um, that hundred dollars would get you 40% of renting base camp for a year from the youth caucus. Cause they rent it for about for $250 a year right now. Um, you can get, um, you know, you could start getting, you could start paying for slack, things like that. Um, so you can use these things. Uh, you can invest in these systems to provide long-term resources to help your organizing be more effective, to help your growth. And to me, 25 yard signs versus 3,000 text messages as a no brainer to me. It's not even something that I think that we should be continuing, um, you know, or we should be considering being comparable. Um, and even, even getting into things like StreamYard, um, you're going to reach, you know, you have the potential to reach way more people with a stream than you do with that yard sign where you're, you know, depending on what, if you have a good location, it, it, the yard sign could reach more people. But that yard sign only, like the one behind Howie, all it says is Howie Hawkins, Angela Walker, Greens for President and Vice President, right? That yard, that live stream, if you catch someone, they get to hear your policies, they get to hear you speak. Um, so by, if we can really start as state parties, rethinking how we do things, rethinking what resources are, um, you know, we can, like, we can, kind of, we can start changing how we organize this. We can start organizing more effectively. And we can start using these tools, like I said, not to replace our work on the ground, but to supplement our work on the ground. Um, it can make our day-to-day -day work more efficient. Um, it can help us contact people uh, more regularly. Uh, Andrea brought up um, emails earlier. I'm not going to get too deep into emails, but one of the biggest problems I see in the Green Party is we have a database contact list engagement problem, right? Uh, people saw, I, I remember when I served on the National Committee and we had thousands of uncontacted volunteer requests, and I guarantee that number is stacked up even more. Um, so people are trying to sign up and it doesn't get done, right? And systems can help with this, right? Uh, in Illinois, I actually just moved us away from Nation Builder to Action Network, but Nation Builder has, oh, I can't think of the name. I, I can't think of the, full, the word that they use for it, but you can automate some of this stuff. Someone signs up for your, for your email list, they get the automatic email. A week later, we're close, yeah. A week later, you can have an automated email sent going out and saying, hey, here's when our next meeting is. Here's this, this way you can get involved. Here's another way you can get involved. Here's another way you can get involved. You can have these automated emails set up so that when someone signs up for your list, even if every person in an organizing drops the ball and doesn't get that one-on-one -on -one contact, that is the essential thing that has to happen to turn that person from a supporter into an organizer. Even if that doesn't happen, you keep the contact hot. You keep con you keep some you keep in touch with them. You keep informing them of ways they can get involved, and maybe that'll give your overloaded volunteer coordinators 
time to actually get to them and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. But in the Green Party, these lists just sit, right? States buy their, and in, in Maryland, it sounds like you're doing a, a much better job than the rest of the country. Not surprising, I have long held Baltimore as one of the top local parties in the state or in the country. Um, It's really not surprising, but for most of the green part, go out. Uh, notice of meetings don't go out. It gets posted on Facebook, which is a very algorithm limited, um, you know, platform. So most people don't even see it. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're doing, uh, you know, that kind of the, the email outreach. It, it seems like it's old school. Um, you know, Andrea was talking about phone banking to millennials. I got to tell you. Most millennials I know aren't going to answer the phone. We don't want to talk on the phone. We don't want to answer a number we don't know. Um, we don't want to have a really bad audio connection over over a phone line. Um, so for you know for systems, they can help us connect with people in different ways too, right? The email gets to the people who like email. The Facebook gets to the people who like Facebook. The you know Twitter posts get to the people on Twitter. The one-on-one -on -one contacts get to the people who aren't, you know, responding to any of them. And you can create a, you know, multi-tiered system of engagement or a multi-layered system of engagement that covers a whole lot of your group, a whole lot of your potential organizers. So I've talked a little bit about social media. I just really want to re restate over and over and over again. Social media is a tool that can give access to your potential supporters. It can allow for efficient communication, it can allow for engagement with current new supporters, but it is an organizing tool. It is a tool and not a thing that is self-sufficient in and of itself. Uh, the level, if you, all you do is post on Facebook, the basic level of, or, of you know, engagement that you can expect is possibly creating a voter, right? They, they like what you do and they'll vote for you when they see your name. Um, but if you're not actively turning them out to meetings, if you're not actively getting them involved in your work, they're never going to become anything stronger than a voter, um, maybe a member, um, if you've got dues or if you have a sign up. So, because, and that's because without a, you know, an, an organizing onboarding component that is tied directly to on the ground, real face to face political organizing, without that, social media is one directional. You say things outward to them. They can comment. You can respond. But it is a very one-directional communication tool, um, it may, which means it's really, really difficult to advance someone from a voter to a supporter to an organizer to a leader, right? That basic kind of Alinsky ladder steps. Um, it's really hard to do that if the only thing you do is post to Facebook post to Facebook or, or post to Twitter. Um, to, to step up those ladders, you really need to stay in contact. You need relationship building. Um, so if we're, you know, if we're going to use social media and we should, how can we use it? I, I actually, Maryland is one of the, the places I talk about when I talk about this. And that's because one of the things I did during the campaign was help develop the green map, um, which is, uh, greenmaps.us and it shows every single local green party in the country that we could find um, same thing with when there are candidates running we get them and so you can go you can click your state you can see the list of locals you can find the local nearest to you i did maryland and what i found was that basically every county in maryland seems to have a facebook page set up by the state party with no engagement with the, and, and that is a really good groundwork right you need that way um we need that way to you know allow people on the local level to engage on facebook but they're sitting empty they're sitting stagnant when someone comes and finds them they say oh there is no green party here um so the you know while it was while it is a necessary thing to have set up if it's not properly ran it show it it displays a lack of organizing. It shows that there's nothing happening and it de-incentivizes de people from getting involved. Um, so when you do have, when you're on social media, quality, consistent content is the name of the game. Um, you know, Facebook is algorithm hell. 
where they really punish you um, for not for not following the rules. And their major rule is consistent quality posting, right? Um, for most locals and state parties, post one to three times a day. Facebook is still where people have local connections. You're friends with the people in your neighborhood. You're friends with the people in your community. In Twitter, not so much. Um, Instagram, not so much. YouTube, not so much. Facebook is kind of the last bastion of that local connection. Um, Twitter, like I said, not largely non-local. It really rewards quantity over quality with its algorithms. The loudest person wins. It, the platform stunts uh, depth of conversation. But at the same time, it allows you direct access to people, direct access to journalists, politicians. You can post a lot more there. Um, but I, you know, I really try to hammer into people, retweets don't vote. Like they don't constitute anything. And when you have this engagement on social media, it doesn't give you a real contact with a real person. So we really got to find ways to, to turn those social media engagements into actual contacts, emails, phone numbers, addresses that we can use to go talk to someone, someone one on one. Um, Instagram, kind of the opposite of Twitter, quality over quantity, post less, but make sure it looks good, uh, super visual focus. Um, YouTube has a huge user base. I'm seeing it more and more become a major part of uh, bringing people on, right? When we, after the election, we saw a huge spike in youth interest in our, in, in the Hawkins Walker campaign. And most of that engagement came on YouTube, not on Twitter, not on Facebook, but on YouTube. Um, a warning about ads, uh, Facebook ads are designed to get you stuck in this cycle, right? So if you are reaching a thousand person on average with a post and you boost it and you get to 2000, they expect your next post to reach 2000 without a boost. When you don't do it, they cut your legs out from under you. Um, they really want you to the point where you're paying for, for reach every single day. Um, and most green parties can't afford that. So we are stuck in the organic growth, slow, consistent posting, doing, doing the, you know, it, it's kind of doing the hard work of organizing and building that we need to be doing on the ground near digitally. Um, so I, I met before I close up real quick, I mentioned that we need to, um, make sure that we're turning these social media engagements into um, you know, direct contacts. Uh, and, and it's really, really, really important that we do that. Um, if everybody here has probably seen a petition online, right? Sign my change.org petition, blah, blah, blah. It's important for people to know, and, and I, I feel like I'm ruining petitions by do it by saying this out loud on my workshops, but the sole purpose of that petition generally is to get your email address. Most pet online petitions are never turned in, never turned in. They are there as an engagement tool to collect that email address so we can come back to you later and say, hey, how about you get involved? Hey, how about you give us money, right? Um, and, and it's why so many of you, so many of us end up on email lists we never asked to be on because we signed a petition for someone we didn't know who the, what the data, you know, the data policy was, and they gave it to Democratic candidates. Um, so that said, petitions, surveys, contests, ranked choice votes, these kind of things are, are great engagement tools that we can run on our social media that will bring in new contacts, uh, new contacts. Um, you know, in the Hawkins campaign, it, in the Hawkins campaign, we're a little skewed in our numbers because we bought a lot of voter rolls. Um, so we, we, you know, at times we're importing millions of people, large numbers of people. Um, but in general, new contacts overwhelmingly are coming, not, you know, are, are coming from these kind of things. Um, you know, you'll get some from your website and things like that, but petitions, surveys, these kind of things can collect, help you collect that email, that phone number, that address that can help you identify where someone's at, how to get someone local in in touch with them and get them moving so you know to close up no matter how good the system we have no matter how good of systems you bring in uh you've got to get buy-in from organizers and members it's really really important often systems are implemented top down and then abandoned very quickly uh, you've got to get buy-in and you've got to let you've got to say we're going to suffer through this for a while right um, in illinois when we moved off email and moved to base camp we killed email, 
we shut it off to force people into base camp. And we said, I, I believe we said two years is what we're doing this before we even consider a move. You've got to give people time to adapt. Uh, you got to get buy-in. So, you know, this is David versus Goliath that we're dealing with. Uh, we have to really rely on being effective. We have to really rely on being efficient um, if we're going to do it. We got to think of our state and local parties as, you know, the foundational places where our systems live. And though the, their goal is not to just sit and hoard the system, right? The goal is that they are the but they are the operation center that can get these systems deployed to your local organizers on the ground. Um, so yeah, let, that was a lot in uh, in about you know twenty minutes. Uh, like I said, I will uh, let me reshare. There's those links. If you want to get deeper in, you know, I can, I got a lot, like I said, I took three hours and put it into 15 minutes. I'm all, I will also say I'm very happy uh, to work with state parties to do, you know, specific presentations to them based on what kind of system they're interested in and, and things like that. Um, this is, I'll also say this is kind of a rare thing for me in talking to Maryland where I know uh, you guys are already ahead of the game in a lot of this stuff that I've talked about. So, um, you know, kudos for that. And, uh, you know, I think the key now is I see the Maryland Green Party and the Baltimore Green Party being on point on a lot of this stuff. How do we get it out to the rest of Maryland? How do we diffuse this knowledge and the, these these uh, best practices out? So with that, I will wrap. Let me, if I could, uh, uh, just very quickly answer Vince Tola's uh, second question here. Um, he's asking, are there resources, books, et cetera, that can succinctly explain how globalization and neoliberalism has affected local communities and what are the progressive solutions to these powerful forces? Now, this is, okay, with respect, um, I, I would uh, very gently challenge the posture of that question. Um, we need to recognize that people that live in local communities are subject matter experts on how the community policies are impacting their lives, right? And so when we come to them and when we say, well, I wanna explain neoliberalism to you, while that is probably precisely what is impacting their lives, um, we, we need to be able to frame things in a way that points out privatization and union busting and some of these other things that are, that are hallmarks of the neoliberal, you know, agenda. You know, one good way to look at it is in is in public schools, for example. You know, kids aren't learning such and such. Well, that's because of the standardized test. If it's not on the test, it's not going to get discussed. So we have to hone that discussion to what is actually happening to people on the ground. Because, like it or not, no matter how smart we are as Greens, to, to the to the individual person in our communities. Our green smarts is never going to be as important as their life experience, right? So we need to always gear that conversation toward that. But what I would say is what a perfect example of a political education forum that you can invite people to so that they can make that connection to them for themselves. So thank you. Yeah. And just to follow up on that really, really quick, um, you know, in my, in my, before I became a preschool teacher, I worked as a, um, I worked many jobs, but one of them was a field director for a community organization. And, um, you know, what, what that really taught me was that oppressed communities don't mean, need me to go in and explain capitalism, neoliberalism to them. They actually probably know it better than I do. They just don't have the, the they don't have the academic language that I do. I, I always talk about, you know, when I was knocking doors in this neighborhood, um, on my, after a, you know, an hour long conversation that was supposed to have been a five minute conversation based on what I told my employees um, or my staff. But I I stayed and talked to this guy for an hour. And at the end, when I walked away, I wrote on top of his card Foucault and doesn't know it because this young 20 something black man talked about power using language exactly similar to that of Michel Foucault, who is, you know, who, who is a inaccessible academic postmodernist, right? But the understanding of power without having any idea who, who Foucault was, was, you know, he, he had an understanding that was fundamental and core, you know? And so 
when we go into these situations, you know, I, I think it's important for us, for us to understand that, you know, in, and this is a very Marxist thing kind of what I'm about to say, but that these common conditions like capitalism, like white supremacy, they manifest in every location slightly different. So you can really understand capitalism, neoliberalism, white supremacy, and not understand how it plays out in this local community. And that's why we have to listen. That's why we have to get engaged in these deep conversations, these, this relationship building, so that when someone starts describing the experiences of capitalism and white supremacy, which make that you know, which have which have oppressed them, then we can enter into the conversation, make connections to how this is a, this is why independent political organizing is essential. This is why um, you know engagement, not uh, disengagement, is important. We can you know once we hear them in their own words talk about how um, these things are affecting them locally then we can start to plug in a lot more effectively than if we go in trying to talk about neoliberalism and waiting for them to try to make those connections. We've got to let people express their lived experience. And then it's our job as political organizers to help them make connections, to inoculate them against how hard this work is going to be and what we face and to provide them with a, you know, a, an organizing path forward. Um, and I, I think it's essential that we focus on providing them with an organizing path forward, not a slogan. Right, we see AOC running on abolish ICE and then voting to fund ICE. We see her running, you know, yelling abolish the police and then voting for more police funding. Um, so I think it's really important that we are all just like with social media, we're always pointing pointing back towards you know real physical political organizing. I was just checking, uh, there was a question in the chat, so I wanted to send that out, but we might be running out of time. So I wanna just kind of be um, mindful of folks' time. And if uh, our panelists, Chris and Andrea, want to answer that last question from Justin in the chat, we can make sure that that goes out. Um, so we had done the intro for Howie, and I'm sorry it's a little disjointed, but Howie, do you wanna just uh, connect back on that? Cause I know we're starting about 15 minutes late here then. So you're gonna have them answer the question or have me give my rap? No, I think you, I think we're gonna move into you. <laughs> okay, and I'll type we, wanna end, we wanna end by 4.30? It, I think it depends on your time, but that's what we said was, yeah, the ending. Well, I got the time, but you know, people expectation was 4.30. So should I stick to that? You should try to, I think. Yeah, we can try to. And then we can have some room for any comments or questions. Okay, well, uh, I was asked to speak to a closing rally, which virtually is kind of strange, about green socialist organizing. And, you know, that's what the campaign that Angela Walker and I ran about, you know, on a green socialist program, an eco-socialist program. So what I thought I'd do is do a brief balance sheet on what we got out of the campaign, and then talk about <clears throat> perspectives and opportunities in national politics in the Green Party's role in it, in the current political situation. We've talked a lot about local organizing. We're not gonna have a national impact if we don't build a local base. So I'm not taken away from that at all. I think that should be our primary emphasis. But we also do have a national presence. So let's, let's take a look at that. So, you know, first thing is I'm surprisingly encouraged and how much energy there is at the grassroots of the Green Party around the country, despite a very rough year. 2020, it was anybody but Trump, and it wasn't just, you know, the corporate liberals, corporate media that totally blanked us out. We were actually attacked by most of the prominent progressive pundits, the socialists, the progressives, the ones you read online in Common Dreams, et cetera. And I, my evaluation is these people gave up on their own analysis because they were saying, we got to back a neoliberal imperialist named Joe Biden to defeat Trumpism. I had a conversation with one whose name you would know, I won't say who it is, 
who said, well, we can start a third party once we get rid of Trump. And I said, hey, Trump is an expression of this old racist political trend in American politics. They were called the Dixiecrats back during the civil rights movement. They were the redeemers back during reconstruction. And they're still around, although they're much diminished. And by backing, you know, neoliberal austerity from the Democratic Party, that fertilizes the soil for the reactionaries, the racists who scapegoat minorities and marginalized people of all kinds for problems that are created by capitalism and the big corporations. And the Democrats don't have an answer for that. So uh, that's the larger dynamic we're in. Now we got over 400,000 votes. Pennsylvania just came in with a, another 1,200 or so. You know, the final count is official with one of those offices in Washington, but you know, the states are still slowly reporting. Now that's about mid range, what we've done since Nader's first campaign, which considering all we went through in 2020, isn't too bad, it's something to build upon. Um, but we have to understand the larger dynamic in these presidential campaigns determines our outcome much more than who our candidates are, what our platform is, how we execute because there's just a larger dynamic and we're like a cork on the ocean. We don't have a strong enough party that's a big boat that can steer our way through those currents. So that, that gets back to local organizing and building that base. Um, so, and we see the results now, you know, the broad progressive movement got behind Biden and what do we got? Voting rights dead, DC statehood dead, uh, DREAM Act dead police reform watered down, if anything, background checks on guns, all their liberal reforms, they can't get it because the Democrats, forget about the Republicans, they're negotiating with themselves and losing because it's not just uh, Manchin and Cinema that don't want to blow up the filibuster. There are about a dozen Democrats that don't want to blow it up and, and Manchin and Cinema uh, are fronting for them. So, you know, infrastructure, I mean, if there's anything you could get bipartisan agreement on, you'd think is infrastructure because everybody can go back home and cut ribbons and they're having a hell of a time doing that. And so I guess the conclusion of this party is we need the Green Party more than ever. And Angela and I campaign on three major themes. And I wanna review those, but suggest now we got a fourth major theme that may be the most important of all because basically our democracy, our representative government as uh, limited and attenuated as it is, is under real serious threat. But I'll make that the fourth point. First of all, the climate crisis, the eco-socialist Green New Deal, what we got from Biden was much less than he promised, which was the worst of all the Democratic candidates in his American jobs plan, and I wrote up 9,500 words on that. You can look it up on the campaign website or go to the Solidarity webzine. It was called Biden's Climate Pledge is a Promise He Cannot Keep. That man lied, lied, lied when he said he was going to uh, cut U.S. emissions in half by 2030. He said 50 to 52 percent, which tells me it's a lie because they can't be that precise. And the program he put forward there's no way, and I, you know, spill it out. But things have moved on, and now they're talking about a bipartisan plan of an infrastructure, doesn't deal with climate, and funds it with neoliberal privatization, public partner, public-private partnerships, and all that good. Uh, I was going to say Republican stuff, but the Democrats have spearheaded that as well. Now, so we're back to defensive struggles, but we can win these. We got the Keystone XL pipeline stop. The cutting edge right now is line three. And we have, you know, our former vice presidential candidate, Winona LaDuke in the middle of that. Uh, the Indigenous Environmental Network has called for a demonstration Wednesday in Washington, DC. I've talked with David Schwartzman with the DC Statehood Greens about getting a banner out there and having the Greens have some presence. And I hope Maryland Greens who can get over there uh, will contact David and uh, let's, let's show ourselves because uh, we got a problem. The, the climate movement, they're reading our stuff, because at least stuff I've been writing, because I get feedback about it. 
but their education and their outreach, they're still deferring to Biden. Like the, the Indigenous Environmental Network's petition last week was stop the Trump pipeline. And the next day, Biden withdrew uh, or supported uh, the company that's uh, you know, being sued by these people to stop construction. So it's the Trump-Biden pipeline. So these are the kinds of things. And then I was just reading today, uh, a guy on Counterpunch talking about how AOC and Sanders' Green New Deal wanted to get to zero emissions by 2030. No, they didn't. They extended our Green New Deal from 2030 to 2050. So, you know, we got some issues we got to debate there and, uh, you know, educate this broader movement. And, you know, Chris mentioned the young people that came to our campaign. Hey, they get it. They see through this crap. And that's why I tell you, we get on these Zoom calls and uh, panels and these young people, I guess they got the time they had it, you know, being locked up in high school. They know this stuff and they know that what they're getting from the Democrats is totally inadequate. That's why a lot of them are coming to us. So that's one issue. The Economic Bill of Rights, the right to a, a job, income above poverty, affordable housing, health care, uh, public education through college, and a secure retirement. These are the issues. These are the broadest issues around which we can build a class-based, multiracial party that can challenge the Democrats and Republicans. Because the people not voting is mostly working people. The Democrats don't speak to them. The Democrats are a coalition of the well-educated elites and people of color who are scared to hell of the Republicans, but they're not speaking to the broader working class. And the Republicans, of course, are the business class, you know, who are also economically conservative. Uh, they don't care about social liberalism versus conservatism, but the other part of the Republican Party is that, you know, racist, socially conservative base. Neither party has a good message for working people. And that's where the kind of thing we're raising in the Economic Bill of Rights, I think is relevant and uh, issues we can organize around. And, you know, there are a lot of issues that are controversial, but these issues, you look at the polling and you can talk to almost anybody about these things, very conservative people. Well, I'll give you one example. Fox News polled on election day how many people are for government-run health insurance, which is the way they talked about Medicare for all? And 72% said, we want it. You know, so even when they spin it, you know, in the question, it's very popular. So this is an issue that, you know, the Democrats, they're not talking about it. They're not even putting the public option forward anymore. Biden had gave up on that. So these are the issues I think we can, can organize around. And there's a vacuum there. You know, in our politics, you know, I was asked by Steve Welser, New Jersey Greens, why are you and Angela talking so much about working people? Well, Steve, that's where the votes are. You know, those people need to be motivated. And I think the way to connect to them, we talked about earlier, the relational organizing, staying in touch, being active between, the, being active year round. So when our candidates come around, it's uh, reinforcing what we've been doing in between. And then the third issue, and this is such a, just a tragedy for the world. We're in a new nuclear arms race. The United States kicked it off with a big modernization program. The Russians and the Chinese have followed. The bullets in the atomic scientists has their doomsday clock, the closest it's ever been to midnight. And this was not debated in the presidential election. It's not being talked about now, except in the you know, margins of the progressive and peace press. And it's just a vacuum that, that we need to step up and uh, insert ourselves into. So there's a nuclear arms race, and then we're getting, you know, under Biden, same imperialism. You know, Colombia, with all that's going on down there, you know, the Colombian military, in which their police are embedded, is a creature of the United States. Plan Colombia. Biden was in the middle of setting that up in the 90s. We're back in. The guy in Haiti that won't leave office after his term is up. Israel right or wrong in Palestine and Gaza um, and in Venezuela. Look, I have a lot of criticisms of the Maduro government. 
I think they've done some anti-democratic things. They're suppressing the left, but those sanctions, it's like when we attack these countries that way, that just reinforces nationalistic and authoritarian responses. And it's killing the people of Venezuela. So the sanctions issue, and you know, Biden, as soon as he gets in there, he's promoting Guaido, you know, who Venezuelans didn't pick him, the US did. So we got a lot on, on the peace issue. But let me let me go to the pro-democracy agenda, because that I think is crucial. We're in a situation now, before the People Act got killed last week. And we had our criticisms of his public campaign financing provisions. I think we got a little overexcited that it's not like we only have existed because we were able to get presidential primary matching funds. That was nice. The reforms they proposed put it out of our reach. The public campaign financing for members of Congress, $50,000 in small donations. Mike Feinstein and I went back and did a spreadsheet. We've had 544 candidates for the House since 1990. We only know of one that would qualify under the new standard, and maybe two others might have. I mean, it's just out of reach for us. So that's an issue. But on the other hand, the federal standards that would make it easier for people to vote, get rid of partisan gerrymandering, more disclosure of dark money, or first disclosure of dark money, all those were good provisions. Now that's all dead. And the Democrats can't get out of their own way to get it passed. So it's now, again, a messaging bill. So I think it's a good time to get involved in this democracy discussion, which is, first of all, not just about getting your right to vote, but also about getting your right to vote for who you want once you're in the voting booth and got your ballot. Because we have a system that is exclusionary. We know about the ballot access problems. And there hasn't been a good fair ballot access uh, bill in Congress since John Conyers dropped his that he introduced in the late 90s and then dropped after the 2000 campaign when they said Ralph Nader spoiled the election. But it set federal standards for federal elections that are much lower than we now have in most states, even though they're still higher than most other democracies around the world. This is something that needs to be a, an issue for us because Right now, we're fighting state by state, battle by battle, lawsuit here, petition drive there. Nevada just passed a law, which Richard Winger says was aimed at the Green Party, <clears throat> make it harder to get on a ballot. They tripled our signatures and, and vote requirements in New York under the COVID, cover of COVID and wiped out all the third parties. Yeah, there are four parties on the ballot line, but the working families always run as a Democrat, the conservatives always run the Republican. So it's four ballot lines, but two candidates. And they call that a multi-party system. So we got to get 45,000 signatures in 42 days to get back on the ballot. Uh, that's so-called progressive New York. So ballot access is a big issue. But I think the biggest thing I came away from the campaign with was this, the spoiler effect is devastating for us. You can go back, there have been uh, 180 years, 46 presidential campaigns. The independent left has only got over 4% five times. Twice the Free Soil Party, the People's Party, Debs one time in the Socialist Party, and La Follette in 1924, a century ago. And even then they were distant thirds because that lesser evil has an impact. We saw it in 2020, now it's worse because the Republicans are not just a conservative party, they're an extremist, racist, autocratic, authoritarian party. So most progressives feel they got to vote defensively more than ever, which makes it harder for us more than ever. But I think the good side of that is we can advance ranked choice voting, particularly ranked choice voting in multi-member districts to get proportional representation on legislative bodies, city councils, county legislatures, state legislatures, and then Congress. We have uh, now 52 jurisdictions that are local and two states. We have campaigns in 45 states for ranked choice voting. These are reforms that we're winning and can win. And particularly if we can get the PR version, the proportional representation version for multi-member districts, 
we can open up the political system. So they can't say we're spoilers. And in the legislative bodies, we get our fair share of representation. And I think we get to that kind of system, the Greens are at least a 20% party. We may be a 30% party. We may be the majoritarian party. If you look at our policies, Green New Deal, Medicare for all, student debt relief, Biden and Trump were opposed, we were for it, but it didn't reflect that in the political system given its structure. So I think these are key campaigns uh, for ranked choice voting and proportional representation that we need to, need to emphasize in our local work. Um, and I'll just mention, of course, the electoral college is a farce. You know, of 50 presidential campaigns since they first started counting in 1824, 19 have been won by a president with a plurality, not a majority. And in five of those cases, the president lost the popular vote. And, you know, we know what happened in 2016. What people don't know is what almost happened in 2020. If a little over 23,000 votes had flipped in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia, those electoral votes going to Trump would have been a tie in the electoral vote, 269, 269. Would have gone to the House under the 12th Amendment, one state, one vote, 26 of the states were majority Republican. Trump would have become president, almost became president, even though he was 7.1 million votes behind and lost by 4.1%. And, and, you know, how do we tolerate this ridiculous farce? So, of course, to change it, people think, well, we got to amend the Constitution. That's hard as hell. There's actually an article coming out, Rob Ritchie and a group of lawyers, uh, soon in the Harvard Law and Policy Review, uh, which says we can do it uh, by legislation. And basically what you do is have a common ranked choice ballot across the states, have the Election Assistance Commission tally those nationally and do a ranked choice vote. It could be done under the 12th Amendment and Article 1, I think it's Section forget which section, but the executive, it gives the, the Congress the authority over uh, presidential elections. So that's a much easier path. And I think it's time to take on the Electoral College. Another issue which the For the People Act didn't address, which the Republicans have made an issue, and that is vote counting and election certification. They're now passing laws. We see it in Georgia where the legislature's usurping the authority to count the votes and certify elections from independently elected secretaries of state and nonpartisan or bipartisan uh, county boards of elections. So they've already started in Georgia. They are going after Democratic and particularly Black uh, members of county boards of election. And the Secretary of State has been stripped of his powers. The legislature makes the final decision. So these Republican legislatures are setting themselves up to steal elections. And when it comes to the presidential election, they're setting themselves up to steal that because in the Congress, uh, they will get their people there through partisan gerrymandering and uh, the states they control, and they will refuse to certify the states. Probably a Democrat would win and steal the presidential election. I mean, that's what I mean. Our representative democracy is in uh, real jeopardy. So vote counting. There's no legislation in Congress. I mean, what the hell are these people doing? The Senate just left on vacation. The 75 days between June 24th, Thursday, and Labor Day, they were going to be there 16 days. And they got to deal with infrastructure, the debt ceiling, the budget bill. You think they're going to get the voting rights? Uh, and these are the Democrats that set that schedule up because they control it. The House will be in there even less. We're in deep trouble. That's why we need the Green Party. Um, last point I'll make is public funding of uh, public campaigns, which, of course, that was our beef with uh, HR1. And I'm trying to pull up here. I want to read this to you because I just discovered this recently. Joe Biden, who's old enough to have been back in the 90s when we actually talked about full public campaign financing and getting all the private money out, not this matching funds nonsense. He had in his platform, 
when he got to government reform, he said Biden will introduce a constitutional amendment to entirely eliminate private dollars from our elections. Biden believes it's long past time to end the influence of private dollars in our federal elections. As president, Biden will fight for a constitutional amendment that will require candidates for federal office to solely fund their campaigns with public dollars and present, prevent outside spending from distorting the election process. This amendment will do far more than just overturn Citizens United. It will return our democracy to the people and away from the corporate interests that seek to distort it. Of course, then the next paragraph says, but in the meantime, I'll go with matching funds, which was the For the People Act. But the fact that he even put that in there uh, tells me there's, there's still a, a possibility of bringing full public campaign financing back, which starts with the We the People Amendment. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, would uh, overturn all these Supreme Court decisions, define money as property, not speech, and corporations as artificial creations, not natural persons with constitutional rights. That would enable us to set up real campaign finance regulation and public financing. So, uh, so anyway, I think those are, are that pro democracy agenda has got to, we got to bump that up because the damn Democrats are not protecting us from the, from the Republicans. And, uh, you know, particularly in states like Georgia, it's, uh, it's going to be a real problem. Texas, they already passed some in Florida. So, I'm just, I'm just gonna wrap up here. So, you know, we, we have formed a Green Socialist Organizing Project and we're still trying to figure out exactly, you know, what the form of that is and how we're gonna organize it. But the purpose is to continue advancing the Green Socialist politics that Angela and I were running on in the campaign. So it's about political education. It's about uh, getting involved in issue campaigns like the Ryan Three fight. Uh, it's about helping uh, people that we can help, you know, on party building and local election campaigns. Uh, we had, you know, I think Andrea and, and Chris talked about some of the things that we need to pay attention to in local election campaigns. So if you want to hook up with that, we have a webpage, greensocialist.net. 